Welcome to Church Experience Online. We're so happy you joined us today. As you watch this teaching video, if you have any questions or need help getting connected, please don't hesitate to reach out by phone or email. Also, our website is the best place to go if you would like to access helpful Grow Step resources, join a serving team, connect in a life group, get your questions answered, or support this movement financially by giving online. At the end of this teaching video, you'll hear an original church experience worship song. We hope this gives you an opportunity to worship and reflect on what you learned today. Thanks again for joining us at Church Experience Online. On this final week of this teaching series, Filtered, we are dealing with the perspectives and the attitudes that impact our lives. And this really matters. It really does because all of our biggest problems, our biggest challenges, and the struggles of our life all come from our filter, how we see the world, our perspective, and ultimately at the foundation, our beliefs. Because our beliefs filter up through our lives and out into our actions. So if we could just change our filters, I think that God could do some amazing things to change how we actually live. Well, in this final week of this teaching series, we're, we're going to go after this, this filter that I think for many of us is a game changer. Because it's the thing that keeps sabotaging our efforts to advance forward and causes us to continue to retreat and miss out on God's future for us. You know, I was standing under a really warm shower at home, and I was, my mind was just tuned out, just thinking about who knows what, just, just relaxing and, and feeling the hot water over my head. And, and, and in a moment, everything changed. In a moment, I, I felt this, this almost piercing, painful, like uncomfortable, ice-cold feeling just, just rush over my head. And I was so shocked because I didn't know what it was that I just yelled out, like a, a panic, kind of almost am I in pain kind of yell. And I just yelled, and, and I don't think that I really even knew what was happening in the moment. But as I felt this shocking, ice-cold feeling all just come over my whole body, I looked up, and they were kind of peeking over the shower. My, my son had climbed up and was grinning down on me with an empty cuff in his hand. He had poured ice-cold water on Dad, and he was so happy because he got me. He had this, this huge grin on his face like it was the best day of his life. And I kind of looked back at him initially with this look like, that's the last grin of your life. <laughs> you know, sometimes people surprise you. You know, sometimes life surprises you. Right? The, the challenges and the, the adversity, the struggles, the things that come up unexpectedly, the, the, the issues, the, the drama, the things that just happen, the hardships, the frustrations, the disappointment. See, things continually, continually crash into our lives, sometimes with some fierce force. They, they just slap up against the, the walls of our lives. And, and sometimes in these moments, we can question God's calling and we can question our commitments in our life. And for many of us, the filter through which we see our life, when these surprises come, we panic. And because we panic, we bail on the very thing that God wants to use to build us and bring us to a better future. And because our filter is, if things are hard, then I bail and I go find an easier way, we miss out so often on the better things that God has for us. And if our filter could just change from panic to a God-ordained perseverance, man, the, the battles would be so different in our life. There would be so many more victories that could come if you would switch your filter from panic to perseverance. Hardship comes and it surprises us and it surprised God's people, the nation of Israel. Caused them to question God's calling. Caused them to question their commitments. The direction God was taking them on. 
In Exodus, you, you can pick up the story, might be familiar to you. God had rescued his people, the Israelites, from this, this wicked nation of Egypt. It had been a home for them, but it had become a place of bondage, a place of captivity, a place of struggle where they were in forced labor. And through amazing miracles that we won't take the time to get into today, God rescued them from the hand of this King Pharaoh. And he set them free to go on this journey towards their future promised land, this amazing place that he had for them, this, this dream, this vision that God had for them. And they were on their journey from captivity to this incredible land of opportunity. And you know, many of us, I think, find ourselves in that tension between we're not where we used to be and we're grateful for that, but we're not where we want to be yet. And it's the surprises that come between where we used to be and where we want to be that sometimes cause the biggest challenge in our life that causes us to bail and back out on what God wants to do. And so this challenge comes for them, this adversity comes from them between, between the land of captivity and the land of promise. And this is where we're going to pick up the story. They've been set free from Egypt. They're moving away from Egypt. They're moving to a new and a better future. And then a surprise happens. Exodus chapter 14, verse 5. It says, When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and all his officials changed their minds about them. And they said, what have we done? We have let the Israelites go and have lost their services. So he had his chariot made ready and he took his army with him. So he, he gathers together this massive military might and they go after the Israelites to bring them back to slavery. They've just broken free. They're finally free to move into their future. You ever, you ever feel like you finally get traction? You finally start to make progress, and then, and then something happens. A surprise happens, and you're like, man, I just started to get ahead, and now I'm right back where I used to be. That's where they are. Verse 9, chapter 14. The Egyptians, all of Pharaoh's horses and chariots, his horsemen, his troops, they pursued the Israelites, and they overtook them as they camped by the sea near pi Hahiroth, opposite Baal Zephon. So they're, they're camped out, the Israelites are. And they're, they're right here in front of a, a sea, a Red Sea, so they, they can't escape, and they have an army behind them, and they have wilderness on both sides of them. They're surrounded, and they're outnumbered, and they're overwhelmed. Have you been there? The lesson I think that we need to learn in this moment of panic, see the Israelites, they were, they were overwhelmed. God was still, we know looking back, God was still about his purpose in their life. God was still going to do something incredible and amazing in their future, but they couldn't see past their current panic. They couldn't see past their current problem. So here's the lesson that we need to know. What's going down doesn't mean I should be moving on. <laughs> when it starts to go down, come down on you, maybe it's raining down on you in a shocking and unexpected way, and that doesn't mean just because it's going down and it's disappointing, doesn't mean you should be moving on. Doesn't mean you should be giving up. Stay in the battle. Someone at Church Experience, a good friend, said to me recently, change your attitude, not your latitude. I love that. Don't change your your. Your direction, God's moving you in the right direction just because you got difficulties. You keep moving to where God has you, and he's going he's gonna to take you there. But, you know, rough seasons, rough days, they, they pull us into to bad habits. They, they pull us back from our commitments, from our calling, and they cause us to consider other options, easier options. Instead of moving on and running right through the problems, and we, we tend to start over. We tend to go what's easy, with what's easier. And, and instead of sticking with the, uh, the calling that God has for us when we have trouble, we back out and forget that God's best for us long term is sticking through. So the filter. The filter, if there's turbulence, I'll just bail out. You know, if the, if the plane starts to experience some, some turbulence, I'm just going to jump. See, the, the problem with that, even if you have a great parachute in mind and then you've got a great exit strategy, the problem is if you bail every time you experience turbulence, you'll never arrive, you'll never travel to the furthest destination that God has for you. You'll never make it to the landing God has for you if you're always bailing out. 
And I, and I think this is one of the biggest things holding us back from the future God has for us. It's, it's this filter that if it's tough, then if it's hard, then surely God must have an easier way. But just because it's difficult, because you feel outnumbered and overwhelmed, that doesn't mean that God's given up on you. In fact, God's right there in it with you. The Israelites were overwhelmed and outnumbered. You know, we, we tend to overpromise and, and underdeliver. We get restless, we get frustrated, we procrastinate finishing. We wander away, we wander to the next thing, to the new thing. We don't come through, and this is a huge problem. This filter of life is holding us back. We lack faithfulness. Proverbs 20, verse 6, it says, Many claim to have unfailing love, but a faithful person who can find. And I just absolutely love this. It's developed into a kind of a personal mantra for me. This, this helped me so much that faithfulness leads to fruitfulness. Faithfulness. Faithfulness leads to fruitfulness. And if we could just be faithful at what our commitments that we've made to God and the calling that he's called us to, if we could just be faithful even through adversity, man, what, what would God do? What could God do through the person who was willing to be faithful even when it was difficult? Man, God could open up so much opportunity. See, there, are, there always will be turbulence in our lives. Jesus told us this, there will be problems. We will face hardship. But, but we are handcuffing ourselves to a future of quitting, running, transferring, looking around, leaving, moving, starting over at the beginning all over again if we always bail when it's tough. This is kind of like the, the person who's... Uh, perpetually looking for the perfect plan for exercise or dieting or the next gym or the next thing. And, and the, but they get into it and it's hard and so they eventually bail and it's like, well, the next thing will do it. And, and here's the thing, it's just an illustration of a bigger problem is that, that we search and, to, and find, but we never stick and finish. You know, in every area of our life, this is a struggle, this giving up trend when it's hard, when it's not convenient. Worst of all, we'll never experience the depth, the growth, the substance, the quality that will come with working through the rough seasons to get the rewards that God wants for us. So here's what we learn. Consistency leads to quality. Completion brings greatness. Faithfulness leads to fruitfulness. Back in Exodus, they're, they're overwhelmed. They're outnumbered. They're panicked. This is how they respond, and I think how a lot of us tend to respond. Exodus chapter 14, verse 10. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up, and, and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified, and they cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? <laughs> is this some conspiracy just to, to, to end our, our lives? Is, is this why you, you brought us here? What, what have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? I can imagine before they looked over the horizon and they saw this, this army coming after them, I would imagine there was all kinds of shouts for joy and expectation about what the promised land would hold and maybe what their future would look like and what their grandparents would, or their grandkids would experience that, that, that they didn't experience and, and, and what things they might do when they get to where they're going and how, how things would be better. And we have these aspirations, these dreams. But then when hardship comes, we panic and, and they're so panicked that they're ready to give up on what God has called them to. They're ready to give up on the promises of God because they're so panicked. But if we would just persevere, I believe we would see more of God's promises fulfilled in our life in, in ways that are, are much more fruitful. See, God always comes through in his word, but sometimes we bail out. Sometimes we back out of what God has for us. You know, Quitting and placing blame is what these guys are doing. They're, they're, they're doing what we tend to do. They're, they're placing blame on Moses. They're terrified. They're crying out to God. They're ready to quit on this journey because it's hard. And you know what? I think quitting has almost become a sport these days. I do. I, I think placing blame on others and quitting, I think it's almost become a sport. It's almost funny how much we do it. And it's somewhat entertaining. Um, can I speak to Rose, please? Rose, I'm sorry, I can't come in today. And I don't think I, I can't come in any other day either. 
I, I, I just, every day I come into work, I hate it. All right, bye. VIP. Let's kick it. Someone in here just got a great idea for Monday morning. <laughs> you know, maybe there are times where we do need to strategically quit because we're on some kind of a summit, and, and in order to get to a higher summit, we have to quit this one and quit climbing and move down through a valley and, and get to a higher place. And, and sometimes that's God's plan for us. Sometimes that is God's calling. But I, I would contend that more often than not, in fact, the vast majority of the times in our lives, when we quit climbing towards the summit, it's not because God's called us to a different summit. It's because this climb is really difficult. And this is really hard. And this is, this is not as glamorous as I thought it would be when I began. And this is, this is a struggle. This is a fight. And every inch is a challenge and a battle. And so to get to the top of this summit would require things of me that I'm not sure I'm willing to give. And so instead of getting to the summit, we start over. And the change is not better. It's not improvement. It's just different. And so we don't get to as many summits because we're constantly starting over. And if you want to get to more summits, you have to stop starting over and you have to persevere. And this is a different kind of filter because when it gets tough, we don't bail and back out. We, we press on. And the Israelites are ready to bail on God's plan for them. And so here's, here's the lesson. It's, it's in your notes. A character question. Will I be known to commit and quit or commit and complete? Your actions decide what you'll be known for, not your words. Will you choose endurance or will you choose another ending? I don't know of any long-term friendships that don't experience offenses. I don't know any marriages that make it for the years that don't have conflict. The greatest relationships, the greatest friendships... Instead of bailing when it gets tough and having a new beginning and a next relationship, it's like we work through this and we work it out and we press through. We overlook offenses, as it says in Proverbs. Will you endure or will you end and begin again? You know, when our expectations are not met, we're disappointed, we're discouraged, we're dissatisfied. In fact, we can become disillusioned altogether. And it was author Tim Keller, pastor in New York City, who said this, we have four options when it comes to the things that disappoint us in life. Is one is we can blame ourselves. We, we can say, you know, this is, this is my fault. I, I'm bad, something wrong with me. Everybody else is happy. It must be something wrong with me. Or we can, we can blame the, the things in our life, the other people in our lives, and we can get upset. It's their problem, and I'm just gonna move on to what we think is better, the elusive Better pastures, greener grasses. 
So we can blame ourselves, we can blame others, or we can just blame the whole world. You know, it's just, the whole thing is wrong. The whole group is bad. The whole situation, the whole workplace, the whole church, the whole, the whole thing, the whole family, the whole, it's just everybody in the world, it's just, it's bad, and we become empty inside. We become bitter and jaded. And those options are not good options. But he said in referencing the, the work of the classic and amazing Christian author C.S. Lewis, he said this is a fourth option, that we can reorient the entire focus of our life toward God. What does God want of me in this situation? What is God's will? What pleases God? Not what pleases me, because when I ask what pleases me, how do I feel today? We talked about that recently. That doesn't take us where we want to go. It's, God, what do you want? Because we can get restless, and we can get frustrated real easily, and we can very easily bail. And and so, you know, I I love what what St. Augustine said, great man of God. He said, you know, our, our souls are restless until they find the rest in the Father. We are, we're just restless. We bounce from thing to thing, from activity to a person, to situation, to pleasure. We, we are grasping at something that will be the next thing, that will be the greatest thing. But then when that gets hard, we just dump it and we move on. And this is our pattern. This is our filter. And this is where our problems surface from. This is where our, our issues come from. It's an insufficient filter to get you to the future that God has for you. Exodus chapter 14, going back to this story in verse 13. Moses answered the people, do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see, and they're looking out over this approaching and vast and intimidating army. He says, these Egyptians that you see today, this army that you see today, this struggle that you see today, that problem that you're looking at, the difficulty that you have no idea how you're going to get around, that mountain that's in front of you. He says, the the Egyptians you see today, you'll never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. You need, what you need is only to be still, to persevere through it, to trust in the Lord your God to deliver you from the difficulties that surround you. Do not be afraid. It takes security, security in God to remain and stand when you feel pressure. See, they were surrounded by wilderness, a sea, an army. They had no good options. But there are better options than fighting against or running from. And that better option is to put your hope and your faith in Jesus, to press on and to let God fight for you, to trust that he will deliver you. So he says to them in Exodus chapter 14, verse 15, he says, then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Raise your staff and stretch your hand over the sea to divide the water so that the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. So God did want them to move forward, to step out into the sea that he had parted, but God's command is and was for them to stand still and see the deliverance of the Lord. They didn't have to go fight the Egyptians and pick a fight and try to hope to win. They didn't have to run through the the wilderness and try to escape. He said, just stand still, see the deliverance of the Lord, persevere on this journey, let me part the waters, let me do my work. In the meantime, you do have an important role to play. You know, we tend to panic and run away from what God wants and, instead of remaining committed to, to his course and the commitments we've made to him. And, but, but still, we can make progress in, through, our, through our actions. And so here's the filter that I think will help us. We wait and work towards God's promises. Write this down. We wait and we work. We wait on God and we work towards God's promises for the future. You know, the promised land really meant something in this moment. And, and, and God's promises to you that he won't leave you, that he won't forsake you, that he's not going to give up to you on you, those promises, man, hold on to those in the moments when it's tough. Because God's not going to give up on you. And so when, when you're going through it, and it might just be a day or it might be a long season, when, when you're in the midst of the pain, man, hold on to those promises. They mean something. They mean that, that these things are not going to destroy you, that God, God's going to get you through it. And it means that God still has a better future for you. It means that when you don't see a way, when you see wilderness on both sides, an army behind you, a sea in front of you, that God can make a way. Even when you don't rationally see a way, God can make a way. Because that's our God. See, God's dreams that result from perseverance, not panic, are, are amazing. 
But most people never see them. Because they panic and they run. They panic and they quit. What does it take to make you give up on God's direction for your life? How hard does the enemy have to press into your life to cause you to quit on God's plan for you? He knows. He knows your weak spot. He knows where you tend to give up. He knows where it gets hard and you get easily frustrated. He knows where you get disappointed the most. He knows how to discourage you. So what does it really take? How hard would it really be to cause you to quit on God's future for you? So you have to press beyond that limit if you want to see God's, God's future for you. And the, and the Israelites, they're in the midst of it. And so, so, so I, I would say if, you, if you're where the Israelites are and you, you feel surrounded, outnumbered, overwhelmed, and you don't know which direction to go, I, I'd say don't give up. Keep showing up. Show up day after day to what God's called you to, and you just, you just keep following him. You keep fixing your eyes on Jesus. You keep following him, pressing on. Don't give up. Don't back down. Just show up, but don't give up. God did ultimately provide for them, and he rescued them, and I think this will be helpful for us to see what God did in their story. Exodus chapter 14, just a part of the conclusion of this is amazing. It says, then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all that night the Lord, he drove the sea back with a strong east wind, and he turned it into dry land. It's a miraculous thing that God did. The same God who created that sea caused wind to blow on it and separate it, and the waters were divided. The Israelites went through the sea on dry ground, a way they hadn't seen when they were in the midst of their panic. They went through a dry land with a wall of water on their right and on their left. That would have been incredible to see. The Egyptians pursued them, and all of Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen followed them into the sea. During the last watch of the night, the Lord looked down from the pillar of fire and cloud at the Egyptian army, and he threw it into confusion. He jammed the wheels of their chariots so that they had difficulty driving. And the Egyptians said, let's get away from the Israelites. The Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. See, even their enemies recognized that God was, was fighting for them. Even those who were against them knew that God was for them. It was evident in their life. The person who follows God through hardship, you can see the evidence of God's activity. Is there enough evidence in your life to convict you of being a persevering, following, hard following, intensely committed follower of Jesus? Verse 16, they're being pursued into the, excuse me, verse 26, they're being pursued into the waters. It says, then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so that the waters may flow back over the Egyptians and their chariots and their horsemen and that's exactly what, what God did. He rescued his people through a miraculous provision and destroyed their enemy, destroyed the adversity in their life. And whatever the difficulty is in your life, man, God can overcome it, even though you right now may be overwhelmed by it. Maybe you'll get to that moment. Man, trust in God, but don't trust in your own strength. If you trust in your own strength, it creates insecurity when when your strength collides with the greater challenge and you see your comparative weakness, it causes insecurity. But if you trust in God's strength, it builds security in your life because regardless of the size of the battle, your God is greater than the battle that you're fighting. Your strength, my strength, is not greater than the battles that we'll fight. There are some battles that are far greater than us and no amount of, hey, I can do it, and I'm going to just be good enough or great enough or smart enough or whatever enough. Like, there's battles that are just bigger than you. But there's no battle that is greater than our God. It's amazing to see God's hand of provision and protection when we need it most. There's an amazing story that came out of the town I grew up in where my parents still live and have lived for so many years now. And it's kind of on the outskirts of their, their town in West Michigan, kind of a farming community that is kind of a little, further, a little distance away. And there was this crazy story that happened to this guy who almost died, and he saw God's provision. It's an amazing story. The pain is something I just can't explain, but also just the fight to get back, to get home. I want to go see my wife. I want to be with my kids. That's a fight you just don't realize how deep it is until it is brought out of you. 
On a bitter cold night in December 2013, Tim was working alone in a field. As he stepped to the back of the tractor, he tripped and fell near the PTO shaft, which connects the tractor to the manure spreader. The shaft spins at over 500 rotations per minute. I could feel the thing starting to wind up on my left side of my pants, and um, I knew I was in trouble. I reached out to grab whatever I could hold on to. And with seconds, I was just being wound up and beaten up against the frame of the manure spreader and then thrown off to the opposite side, just literally naked with all the clothes stripped right off my body. Yeah, I, I was scalped to the head. I had four fractured ribs, four fractured vertebrae. My spleen was split. My hip was displaced. My femur broke. My ankle was crushed. I can remember looking down and seeing my leg laying across my lap and just this huge bulge in my side. He tried crawling toward the tractor. And I was done. I, I would burned up all my energy, and I remember just saying a very simple prayer, and it was, Lord, either get me back on that tractor or I'm ready to come home to you. I truly believe angels were there with me, and God wasn't done with me yet, and he helped me get back onto the tractor seat. And I can remember the feeling once I got up under the tractor seat of, thank you, God, I'm on the tractor. Now I have to push in the clutch with my foot that's dangling across my lap. Thankfully, he was able to get the tractor in gear and moving. Though his body was shutting down, his heart and mind were focused in prayer and thankfulness he was still alive. He drove his tractor onto a nearby road and blocked traffic. The first driver there was an off-duty firefighter. Within minutes, Tim's wife got the phone call she had feared for so long. He introduced himself as a deputy, and I could hear Tim screaming in the, in the background, and I knew it was that phone call. When Teresa got to the scene, Tim was surrounded with neighbors and family praying and helping emergency personnel. It was so out of control and so much chaos. You had no choice but to rely on the Lord, just to, and I literally did fall to my knees and start praying. There's nothing more that I could do for him. One thing after another of the right people there at the right time, that is all God's hand in this. Tim was rushed to the hospital where doctors were able to save his leg and stabilize his condition. It wasn't luck that a doctor was able to fix me. Yes, God worked through that person to fix my body but it's only by the grace of God that I'm sitting here today. Sometimes people wonder, I pray, is God even hear me? I was laying naked in a, in a cornfield, beaten almost to death. God was right there. He listens. He's not going to sometimes answer you the way you want, but he is there for you all the time. What an amazing story of, in the midst of panic, the peace that came as he prayed and said, God, I need you in this moment. And God gave him exactly what he needed in this moment. You know, and the next time that you're in a, in a spot of panic and you're overwhelmed and outnumbered and discouraged and you don't know what's going to happen in your future, you don't know how it's going to turn out, this might even feel like the end, so to speak. Let the peace of God that transcends all understanding come into your heart as you pray. And here's, here's the lesson. Here's the second part of this filter. It's that, that, that while we are waiting and working towards God's promises for the future, here's the rest of it. While praying and looking for God's provision for, for right now, for today. See, there is something that you can do when you, are, when you are overwhelmed, and that's that you can cry out to God. You can hold on to him. With unwavering faith, you can pray and say, God, I need you now in this moment. And you can hold on to the promises of God like, like the Israelites who cried out to God, I'm terrified, God, I don't know how it's going to go and I'm surrounded, but God, you, God, are above me and around this whole situation. I trust in you, I'm going to depend on you, and I believe I will see the faithfulness of my God. I believe I will see the provision of my God as I trust in him through prayer. And, and that's accessible to you in your greatest moment of need, in, in your highest summit of life. God can take you higher. In your lowest moment, God can comfort you with his peace. And everywhere in between, as you struggle up this journey of life, God is with you. Let me, before I pray, read to you one final, one final passage from God's word in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16. This is, this is for us. This is for our filter to be different 
to be more reliant on him. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Fix your eyes on Jesus in the middle of the battle, in the middle of the climb or the fight of your life. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Trust in him and focus on what's lasting. Focus what's on eternal, not the temporary, not the things that are seen, but focus on what's unseen. Focus on the power and the faithfulness of our God who loves you, who's in it with you, who's not gonna bail on you. So don't you bail on him. Right on. Thank you for joining us at Church Experience Online. Please don't forget to check out our website if you would like to get more connected, learn more, get your questions answered, or support this movement financially by giving online. You're now gonna hear an original Church Experience worship song. We hope this gives you an opportunity to worship and reflect on what you learned today. Drawing us near, invited to your kingdom.